thank you for coming here uh, in the afternoon because I know everyone's sleepy after the lovely lunch we had. But um, well, I would like to preface this by saying that um, since I'm not from the US, I would give a little background about myself. I was, I was, I'm an Indian by origin. I was uh, born in New Delhi, uh, in India, and I grew up the first 22 years of my life. I was in India. So we don't have to go into my entire uh, childhood. We will take this story. So this is going to be, today my presentation is going to be more of a story. So what is my story? Where did I come from? What Where did clay come into my life? And how did this journey go? So that's what I'm going to talk about. And in between that, I'll throw in a few pots here and there so that you know what it's about. So let's uh, go back to this. Uh, this is April 1996. And I was working in a software company like a lot of Indians. And I was I just graduated, graduated got my first job. And I used to drive every day past these um, street potters. And they're literally street. It is on the streets of New Delhi. And I would cross them every day in my in my commute. And it I would see some people throwing. And it seems so interesting. And one day, completely on a whim, I decided I really wanted to try this. So here I am, all dressed up in my good clothes, I get up, get out of my car and I ask them, I'm like, I want to try this. And now you have to go back to India in the late nineties. It's not as like, it's not normal for a, a girl from a, an affluent family to just go down in the street and say, I want to make pots because it was very, it was kind of classist, you know, like it was, uh, so it was weird for that man. He's like, what is wrong with her? And like, I'll pay you money. Please let me try this. Like, just like, let me feel this. So, so he asked his nine-year-old son, because it's all the entire families involved in this. So he asked his nine-year-old son, he's like, okay, let her play. So here we are sitting on the, this is not the actual picture. This is just a stock image, but because I wasn't uh, thinking about an artist art statement then. I was just, you know, I was just thinking about, you know, just doing, I don't know. So I wasn't planning ahead, right? So here I'm, I am. He centered some clay for me and I would open, I would play, it would collapse. We kept doing that over and over again. And there was this huge crowd that built up around us because it's not natural for such a thing to happen. Like I was all muddy. I didn't know how to, I was all muddy. I was wearing good clothes. I was all muddy. And this kid is playing. And we just playing. And that moment was like an aha moment that, oh my God, this is such an amazing feeling that wet clay slipping through my fingers. I'm like, I can do this for the rest of my life. So I go to my dad and say, I want to become a potter. And he's like, what is wrong with you? We don't do that, you know? And so uh, I'm like, I wanted to quit my job and start learning pottery. And he's like, no. And so I'm like, okay, I will not do it. So, because I was kind of obedient, you know, I did not know how to go against the brain. And luckily that same year, I get married to my best friend who's sitting right here. And he, his job move brings us to America. And um, I, on the, literally on the first day, this is Atlanta, I find a beautiful, beautiful art, art uh, uh, school. It's called the Callenwall Art Center. It's in Atlanta. And I enroll myself and I start making pots there. Like I just go there every day, park myself at nine in the morning till they throw me out every day. I would just go there and, not not just did I learn how to make pots, and this was five years of uh, uh, from 1998 to 2003, we were in Atlanta, and I learned how to make pots. But more than that, I I learned about America. Like I was just I just come from India. It was a completely different culture, completely different you know place, and the community there just embraced me. I was a very young, I was 22, and most people there were about in their 40s. So they became like my, some of them became like my moms. They were just, this is not how you say this. This is how, not how you do this. It was very sweetly. They taught me about America with so much love and so much that I fell in love with this country uh, because my first people were clay people. They were all clay people. So I, I thought that was 
I thought the entire America was like that because that was my word. <laughs> okay, that's shattered later, but that's okay. I'm not going to that. that. <laughs> but it was, it was, so um, like any beginner potter, I started making these big, fat, lumpy pots, which uh, would go on a, you know, a community shelf. Oh, uh, this didn't go to the, oh, mouse, mouse, sorry. Oh, it's big there. Okay, sorry. So yeah, you know, you all every every place has these community shelves where your all your beginner pots are, and you, it's so hard to make out your beginner pot from another person's beginner pot. So I started making marks on my pieces, like I started drawing and carving, and did little did I know that okay. Going back, I was not into art. I was never, I had never done art growing up, just doodling as everyone does, but nothing like I had taken art classes or I had a profound interest in art, nothing like that. I was, I wanted to become an athlete or a runner, but I, my speed was horrible in seventh grade. Everyone surpassed me. So I kind of gave up on that ambition and I really, really didn't have an ambition in anything else. So I was just chugging along and uh, art was never on the agenda. So when, but when I started doing clay, I started making marks and that's when I realized how deep of an impact my country and my upbringing had on me because my work started, I didn't even know it was there in me, but all my work started, uh, this is all the stuff that I grew up looking at, you know, very intricately carved rocks, wood, different things. And all those carvings started coming out into my work. And so my initial work of course this is not this this is not the beginner work after i had gone through all the growing pains of you know throwing how to learn throwing how to you know once i've started making a body of work so this was my first body of work was all intricately carved you know um cut work and because that's what i grew up seeing so i was making a lot of these uh pieces initially they were all my studio had an amazing access to all kinds of firings. These are all um, cone 10 uh, reduction. And I love the warmth the of the body, that uh, clay body that came out. And so um, I thought I had a path. I was like, great. I, have, I know I'm, my glazes. This is great. I can make this body of work. And then my husband's move brings us to um, uh, five years later, 2003. We moved to Atlanta, uh, to Texas, Austin, Texas, and we have a little uh, first child. And now I have my own studio, which is like a kiln, uh, cone six electric kiln, a wheel, some shelves, and the option of either not doing it or do this. So I was like, okay, let me figure out. So I tried making cone six glazes, and they were just flat and terrible and I was so depressed I'm like what happened here you know I thought I had my game figured out and so then I said let me just get away from glazing itself and find a way out and I started going into uh making red uh red, red earthenware work where I could carve and just put a liner glaze be done with it no glazing required and I had I thought I had um I thought I I could do this but the thing is, I though I enjoyed carving, I I mean, I was making really ornate work with a lot of work, a lot of carving. But somewhere I realized that I still, I used to take this work to the shows and people admired it, but people were worried to touch it. They're like, oh my God, it's too beautiful. And I could see that they could, I was like, no, touch it. They said, no, 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 this is, this is to be put up there. And I could realized there was this disconnect. I wanted people to use my work and I was not making function really usable work. So I needed to address that uh, issue. I needed to make glazed work that could be used, you know, because that was, uh, for my heart, I love functional pottery. So I wanted to go back to that functional thing theme, but the cone six electric thing was really bothering me. And right around that time, uh, luckily, I came across this article by Richard Bush. It, it, it says, wood fired look from an electric hill. And that was in just a simple article about using glazes and stains and just that little, it was like a beacon of light. 
it it didn't solve my problems. It's not like next day I came up with amazing way, but it gave me that hope that, you know what? There is something out there. You should try it. So for the next two years, I kind of stopped really making work. I experimented with all kinds of clay bodies, glazes, just trying to figure out a, a new um, voice in what in Cone 6 Electric. So then I found a, a kind of, a, started finding a kind of balance between um, my functional wear, like there's some carving, but it is still functional, more, more accessible to people, more affordable that people can use and serve out of it, could be put in the dishwasher. And so I started enjoying making this. And for a while, I made pieces with carving and glazing and they're all functional dishwasher safe. But um, then I still I still had the the fascination with the reduction fire. The, the reduction fire brings in more variables that I was not able to bring into my work. It was more, still more static. So again, I've been very lucky. Every time I've been stuck, I've been shown a way. And this way came in form of a workshop that I attended. Now, to tell you, back then, I was a hopelessly obsessive wheel thrower who was completely afraid to do anything on uh, uh, anything remotely close to hand building. Like if I needed a slab, I would throw it, then wait for it to dry and use it. Like I was so afraid of hand building. So I wanted to push myself out of the comfort zone and I took a three day hand building workshop. Now that didn't go well. It, I didn't, I was, didn't do anything apart from talking to people. But in that talking, I met this person who showed me the next path. She was in the process of building a spray booth. And she's like, why don't you spray your glazes? It'll change everything. I'm like, what's a spray booth? I had no idea. And so she's like, just get a old, just get a paint sprayer, just get a compressor, start spraying outside, see whether you like it. And sure enough, suddenly I, you can see the work. It's again, still Home 6 electric, but you can see that it started having more variation just by the virtue of spraying glazes. My clay body, if you can if you can see the darkness, is coming from the clay body. My clay body fires black at cone six. So when I'm spraying my glazes, I'm feathering it. I'm not covering the whole pot. I'm feathering it to the point where one glaze finishes and there's some raw clay, clay body and then the other glaze blends into it. And that darkness created the variation. So again, I was happy with for a while for what with what I was working on as so I was making these pieces. But then I started, this is now 2012-ish, I started noticing a disconnect within me. I noticed that I would enjoy making these pieces, but I never wanted to keep any of these. I would go out and I would covet pieces like this, but then I would come back and make pieces like this. And I would never want to keep any of this. I mean, they were fine, but I enjoyed the process, but I never wanted to use it myself. I was the the wood-fired pieces, just the organic, earthy, simple, crunchy pieces would just call so much to me, but I just couldn't help it. I couldn't do it myself. I would I would always lust over that and, and end up making things like this, you know? So, um, it was 2015 and we, my husband had a, um, he got to go to Taiwan for a week. So he, we, I went along and I remember, still remember, I had made a bunch of mugs that I was going to carve. So they were all made. We were just going for a week. So I covered them up. We went to Taiwan and I, I, I went into a Japanese gallery in Taiwan where they had this piece, um, now this piece, like I couldn't, no one, uh, so there's a village, a town in um, Taiwan called Inge, which is all ceramics town. So I spent three blissful days just, just walking up and down. And the best part is no one could talk to me. I could talk to no one, language problems. They avoided me. I I just stared at work. They didn't, they didn't heckle me. Like, what do you want? Nothing. They couldn't, <laughs> they, they, they ignored me completely, right? And so I was like literally absorbing everything. So when I looked at this piece, I mean, I fell in love with this piece. Now, this was 
you know how every time you are comfortable with buying a certain amount, like this is how much you spend. Now, this was above my threshold that I ever gone. So I was a little scared. I needed that push, you know, like, so I called my husband. I'm like, because I needed him to say, yeah, yeah, go ahead and get it. You know, someone else to say that, right? But there was no connectivity, so I couldn't get him. And I was like, no, I don't think I can make that decision on my own. So I start walking. I walk a mile and a half back to the train station. But this piece is in my head. And I'm like, I don't care. No, if I walk back and I buy this piece, I have no idea who the artist is because they couldn't say. They just, I asked for the card. They gave me their gallery card. So like, it didn't work anyways. But this piece came and became the centerpiece in our house. So when I came back, I looked at those mugs that I had carved. And I was like, I don't think I can do this ever again. I don't think I can carve. Because this piece kept calling to me. And it kept calling to me. And like, I want to do this. But I still am a cone six electric person. How do I do this? So I went through a period of serious frustration. But again, a miracle happened in the form of a person you guys probably know who this is. Does anyone? Anyone here? Yes. 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 And I don't even know him, but I saw him on Instagram and I saw him collecting stuff and incorporating in his work. Of course, he knows what he's doing. But I was like, wow, the idea. Now I'm thinking cone six oxidation basically gives you what, whatever you put in is what you get. So what if I start introducing variables Will that create variation? So that started me on the journey of collecting stuff. So wherever I go, I, I started putting, you know, a little bit of gravel. This is in India. We were, it was just mounds of that. And I, it's not like I get bags of it, just one small Ziploc bag, just to see what it's going to do. And I brought it, I incorporated it in my work and I started seeing results. So I mixed that in slip brushed it on, sprayed some glazes. And again, if you remember, my clay body is black, so I have that dark background. And I started seeing a direction. So then we just started digging like everywhere. Everyone in my family knows the best gift you can give me is just get, go anywhere, get me just a small bag. I'll be happy to try it, you know? So I started uh, indiscriminately applying everything of course like this was a big journey because here this piece looks beautiful right but everything popped off so I learned about how lime blows happen there was so much calcium carbonate in that sand that I did not know that calcium carbonate absorbs water and then after some time everything will fall off so it was a beautiful and I still remember I had once made this piece where I wedged in a lot of calcite crushed calcite I wedged it in and I made this piece. It was just leather hard. And I picked, put, a, put it on my Instagram and saying, oh my God, this is so cool. I've crushed in calcite and I can't wait to see how this is going to work. And Mitch Eiberg, he saw my post and he's like, ah, I don't think that'll work. Like, I don't know what he's talking about. He's like, calcite might not work. He just said that. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I go, so I biscuit, everything's good. I pour the liner glaze and I wish I had captured it on camera. It crumbled completely, crumbled. So that was an experience that you cannot do everything and, and le learn, listen to other people. But I learned how calcite, calcium carbonate can be a very big, uh, it can, if using it as inclusions, you have to be very careful as to how to use it. But um, it was a great experience to, you know, uh, see how you think, every, oh my God, let me just try it. And then everything falls apart. But anyways, but it's had started me on a journey. So this is Sedona sandstone, uh, rich sandstone brushed on, with, mixed with slip, brushed on the piece. And so everywhere we go, just a little bit of sand. This is in Jordan. This is red sandstone they had. So I got a little bit from there. This, we were waiting for the bus we were in Jordan. This was at the baptismal site of Christ. And there was a little puddle, a little dried up puddle, which had little flakes of, you know, clay. So we picked up the little crust and we tried it. It was fun. So that is what our trips, when we can't go back, that's how our trips are now. You know, that's what it looks like. So um, 
so basically i found a, so this is now where i say i have now moved from my indian phase and i've gone into my japanese phase you know i found the i started reading about babi sabi and i understood what was what was it that was really exciting me about the pieces that i was looking at why was i not happy with my own pieces and i started finding a connection in interestingly once back uh, back in india i am a i was an undergrad in psychology and we had to take a design judgment test and it's called the graves design judgment test and i was i got the lowest marks on that everyone did well i was 5 percentile on that 5 percentile and it said never ever ever go into an art uh, you know that that's what it meant it was an aptitude test like you have no aptitude for art but then i read a book on babi sabi and uh, about the asian as opposed to western design aesthetic and they said that there is a complete difference the proportions that um, the the western design calls for the asian aesthetic has a different thing so then i was like maybe there is hope for, there maybe i if there was a scale which was the babi sabi scale maybe i would have passed because i didn't pass the western scale so um that uh, but that got me going on i have i started finding my voice i felt this is what i wanted to make i wanted to make really rustic pieces coming out of my electric kiln i wanted not to have that constraint like you know how oh i'm limited by my my firing style i didn't want that limitation and i've noticed that the more i push my electric kiln the more i try the more amazing results i get and i feel i've just literally scratched the tip of the iceberg because there is so much i am amazed by what 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 electric kiln is uh, capable of a lot of people like uh, they would come to my booth and they're like oh is this wood fired or like no it's going to be electric and this is all basically what i do is it's built surface is built with putting wild clay slips just that that collected from different places so i can never recreate my work because it could be slips that i had just had this much of and i don't know when i've led four things how will they interact together so i also have that surprise element that wood fire potters have in the open mic their kiln corn six oxidation potters did not have that but now i have that i have no idea what i'm going to get out of my kiln so um so this has been um uh, so this has been my recent work i've been incorporating a lot of crushed rock so i built my surface by building slowly with slips adding some crushed rock then hitting it with glazes and just building the surface slowly doing that and so the next few pieces are and now seeing from the perspective i mean for for people who fire um electric and you can see that this is something that you would probably expect out of a at least a reduction fire but all this was possible on you know in a cone fire in fact when you i was uh, talking to you guys i just remembered um we were so into collecting material i remember my uh, family we were driving past new mexico uh, and just getting into el paso and we were that was when we had literally that was my phase of collecting wherever there is a creek or something just stop and always have zip zip lock bags in the car and a little shovel so that you are ready to pick up samples so we were crossing el paso and and there is a border patrol right there in el paso and so we crossed that and then we saw a dry creek right past that and now um typically texas is all barbed wire it's all, you cannot access anything so this particular creek you could actually jump into like and get stuff so we this was on i10 we pulled over on the side of the road and uh, my husband i my, and our son was younger and so three of us like literally ran into the creek and our daughter she was a senior in high school and she's very precocious and buried she is seeing it from the lens that there are these three brown people digging near el paso like this mexico is right across and we are digging out there she's like 
do you see what it and the, we just crossed border patrol she was so worried till we got our stuff and came back she wouldn't she was like don't do this again she was so stressed out but we have been literally we have been known to stop at the side of the road and we were in St. Croix and we got stuff from St. Croix luckily someone gave it to us and uh, so I've been testing stuff so if anyone has anything in your car that you want to you know, you're carrying some soil and you want to get rid of, I'm here, you can give it to me. So yeah, again, so I'm just going to click through a few few slides. And if you have questions, we can, I mean, we can just, of the process, I know we can't go back to the slide. So if you have questions, so this is all the same, trying to bring that reduction look. So this is just, I'm just going to click through. So if you have questions, let me know, yeah. And I have been playing with brushwork lately and learning how to do that. So that has been fun. So um, just a simple functional wear ladder. Yeah. So you say, you know, you, uh, not everything works out. No, no, no. So no. you have a lot. Oh my work. God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Like eight, like when I'm, when I'm testing, about 80% would be trash. And then there would be that one area. Oh my God, what is that? So how do I recreate that? Then there'll be a whole journey of exploring, uh, getting to that particular surface. And so, yes, I have a lot. Yeah. I'm just going to make a comment here, right? So I, I really feel that, you know, thousand years later, when somebody goes and does the excavation in the round rock trash, <laughs> they're going to find some of these spots and they're going to be Lot. wondering what exactly happened, happened here. What civilization? <laughs> there are so many dead pots. I we kill, like, I kill a lot of pots because yeah, I make. But you want to get limited amount of stuff, right? You have one baggie. Oh, yes, yes. So, so but I do. You do... Figure it out, you're, you're yes, so I get a few and I'm. Move... So I've learned not to get attached because, all, or as it is, the thing with me for me, the most exciting thing is figuring it out. Once I've figured that out, I kind of move on and I want something that I've not figured out, you know? So by the end of the bag, I kind of figure it out. So then I get one good piece, that one or two good pieces, and then that is over. And then let's start a new journey again. So um, yeah, it's, and it doesn't, because I am not, I'm using them, them as slips. So a little bag lasts me a, a long time, you know? It, it's just a little bit, I'll mix it with some water. Maybe if it requires stabilization, some EPK, Gersley borate and brush it on. So all these surfaces have been made by just wild clays, you know, building slips. And so this last few, uh, these are my latest, latest pieces that just came out of the kiln. And oh, the absolute latest, I, I, like the last week, I've gone into a new journey of figuring out how to do lichens. And that is not even being pictured here. So yeah, and that is the End. Oh my. Oh, we have questions about anything. Well, I want to know more about how I remember at the beginning you said that you only like to do wheel work and you were only doing yeah. wheel. So how did you jump over to doing some of that slab work? Exactly. So that come up and it's because like I fell in love with organic edges. Mm -hmm. You know, like these edges, and I and I try to you know I try to contrive and try to build it on wheel thrown pieces, but it looks really contrived. So I was like, no, you know, I wanted to make bowls like this with organic edges. And I realized the only way you can do this is hand building. And I started easing myself into hand building. I love hand building now. I do as much hand building as I do throwing. And people who've been watching my demos for years, they're like, because they knew I was a, like, I was, a, I was totally committed to throwing. And they're like, I, she's hopeless. She will never hand build it. They're like, what happened? I'm like, you know, how do I do this on a wheel? How Wait, do I get this bowl is, is thrown? This is all hand built. This is hand built. Yeah, because how do you do it on the wheel? You know, how do I get the ripped edges? I love the organic look. How do I do it on the wheel? So for the most part, like my these bowls and all are made on the wheel. But when it comes to my plates, my uh, my these these kurinuki pieces, you cannot make those on the wheel, right? Like even the plates, I I could throw my plate in maybe five minutes it's not yeah okay I could throw my plate but getting those edges 
is what I really, it's the edges that I'm really looking for. And that I realize I can only handle. So I have taken to hand building now. I'm a convert. <laughs> so, any questions? Good, we're done. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I'm just going to get some absorbing everything. <laughs> Thinking about, yeah, just the incredible loss rate. Uh, <laughs> when you said 80%, there's like a part of me that was just. Yeah, like, it is. It's oh. like the first few firings are just, it's like, oh, this one piece, let's follow this. Yeah. And then the rest, then I'm just zooming into that. Or maybe it would be a small area on that piece. How did I do it? And I'm not a meticulous note taker. So it's not something, and I don't even, I don't even, I put my make use my recipes as if not the glazed recipes, but the rest of things as if I'm cooking. So a dash of this and a <laughs> sprinkle of that. And so that also doesn't help. But <laughs> so how then do you uh, replicate that one area if you haven't I have with lots how you with a lot of regrets and then I'm like this time I will do it properly and then I start taking notes and by the by the fifth pot, I've, the notes are gone. And I, I basically, I do it so many times that I come to the point when I get it. And the moment I get it, I'm done with that. You know, like if the pieces I'm able to recreate, I'm, that means I'm already over with that journey because the learning is kind of complete. So I'll make a couple. And then, then the opening of the kiln means I know what's going to be in there. And that is not fun. So then I completely change the variables so that it keeps things and it's it's stupid because sometimes I do it right before a show why would you do that before a show and but 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 it's it's like I want to be excited about what I'm doing in my in my studio so so I take chances you know and sometimes I have to apologize that I have only this many pieces because they all got lost with 